All right. So again, thank you very, very much for doing this interview. I really appreciate it. Um, and I would love to hear more about your story. So just to start off, um, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and, um, or I guess I'll introduce myself. I'm Hannah, um, I'm Hannah Aspen. It's so nice to meet you. Um, I swim for Queens University here and I'm in the Knight School of Communication. Uh, so that's kind of how I came across, you know, the opportunity to do this story and talk with you. Um, and I just have some questions about your athletic journey and your life and how you've gotten to where you are today. Um, so I don't know very much about you. So if you wouldn't mind just a brief introduction of you know who you are and what you're up to. Sure. Um, my name is Mystique Rowe. I attended Queens back in 2013. So I graduated the fall semester of 2016. Um, I ran track my full time there. I was specifically a multi. I did a little bit of mainly hurdles. And I am currently, I, I'm sorry, I graduated from night school with, with a BA in relational communications. So I spent a lot of time in the night school, which was a lot of, a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Um, and eventually that set me off in the path of getting to skeleton during the summer of 2016. Um, and it was a bit of a taste of it at the beginning. And then obviously during the, the 2018 Korea Olympics, that's kind of my first actual season on ice. So it was, it was relatively smooth considering I burned through my eligibility for track and I was kind of looking for like the what's next athletically to do because I had one more semester left as college. And I just happened upon skeleton recruiting camp and that's kind of my foot in the door of how that started. It. So it was, it was pretty interesting, but um, relatively similar story for most athletes that come to the sport. Very cool. Yeah, I, I don't really know a whole lot about skeleton at all. Uh, so as someone with very little knowledge of the sport, um, what's important to know about it? How would you describe skeleton? Um, I'll, I'll share how I first heard about it. So back during the Vancouver games, which is 2010, I happened, like it, obviously the Olympics, everyone watches it and I saw a bobsled and I was like, oh, this is cool, this is really interesting. And uh, specifically the four man event. And I saw this one team and it happened to be a German team. And I, I just remember that. And I was excited, so I was cheering for them. I had no idea we had a US team at all. And that's where Steve Holcomb um, was racing and he did really well and it was, like, it was historic for US program. And so I was like, oh, it's really cool. But then there was like a cutaway where they had a skeleton, which is virtually uh, sliding on the same track head first on your stomach down a mile of ice. And I thought it was insane. It was like, people are crazy. Why would, they, why would you do that? It's, it's so, ugh. so I kind of forgot about it for the next six years. And then um, during that summer 2016, there was uh, the USA recruiting coaches that came around the country and just like, hey, like reaching out to track and field coaches, football, rugby, all the power sports. If you have any athletes that'd be interested, come out to this combine. So I, from invitation from another, my, my track coach at the time, um, Baron Camp, um, reached out to one of my teammates, Nikia Squire, and said, hey, you should come out. And I happened to be living with her at the time, so we both jumped into it. We had absolutely no idea. All I knew was I wasn't doing skeleton. There was no way. And so I did my testing. Everything was good. And then um, as we get closer to uh, over, the, well, over the summers going on, they're like, hey, we'd like to invite you up for this uh, rookie camp, except we want you to do skeleton because of my size. And I was like, you're a little small. And I was like, I don't, know, I don't want to do that because it just it didn't seem safe. It doesn't sound safe. And it's just like it didn't register for me. And um, virtually what it comes down to is historically speaking, skeleton was a sport that they used to help develop bobsled pilots. So back in like uh, St. Moritz is like the origin of the sport where Cresta was developed, which is a whole different like animal in itself. Um, and that's for another time, I guess. But Essentially, there's the bobsled, you have the shell that you're riding in, but skeleton, it's just you and the sled and your helmet. So you feel everything, you see everything, you're exposed to everything, and it seems pretty scary, but ironically, it's one of the safer of the three sliding sports between bobsled, luge, and skeleton. And it doesn't sound like it, and it's very hard to convince people of that because of how we're exposed and you're going head first, but it is in um, an ironic way. So I try to make it sound as less daunting as possible because we are going 70 plus miles an hour while we're going down the track and um over time obviously things have gotten better we have the helmet upgrades we have our sleds are a little bit more responsive to us and the runners which is the part that actually is in contact with the ice um specifically the skeleton runners there's some grooves in there so 
it helps with the control, but it's rounder, so it's a lot safer. That's why it's safe. Versus luge, which they go feet first, their spine, their uh, runners are a lot sharper, so it has a lot more control. But the moment something goes off, you're going. So we have a little more grace when it comes to our steering. But for the most part, bobs and skeleton are usually looped together, and then luge is over here by itself. Um, it's just different driving style. Luge takes a lot more time um, to develop. They start kids a lot younger. Bobs and skeleton, a lot of the recruiting's done fresh out of high school, mainly fresh out of college, because a lot of us are pretty developed mechanically, just with power and explosivity. That's how we get through our brakemen. That's how we get a lot of um, skeleton athletes kind of come through, just so they're able to just be able to push off the start. And then we just teach everyone how to drive. So the piloting aspect of it, which is not easy, but it's it's kind of like a, a cliche, uh, catch-22 situation. So that's kind of it in a broad nutshell, but um, it's it's pretty chaotic and it's, until you actually see the layout of it. But it makes sense if you actually are in it. Yeah. So the first time that you went down that hill, 70 miles an hour head first, what were you thinking in that uh, moment? How did they convince you to actually get up and do that? So we had a driving school uh, December 20, no, November 2016, and they had us go from the middle of the track, so start four and then start three. Um, I went down from start four, and you go 25 miles an hour, so it's not as fast, but for the first time, they really can't compare to anything, so you just have to experience it. There was, I was like, there's no way. I'm not doing this. This is so dumb. This, like, you're going to break your neck. You're going to risk your life or nothing, and it was just, like, the raw emotion of just the natural fear that comes into play just was, like, absolutely not. But then on the truck ride back up, I was like, well, let's give it another try. Let's give it a fair shake. And then once I kind of got over that initial fear, we moved up to start three, which is going about 30, 35. There's, there is another start between three and one. They kind of like, you don't need to do that. So we jump all the way to the top and they're like, just we'll walk you off or you'll walk down and, you know, you'll experience it. So at that point you go maybe 60, depending on the ice conditions, 70. And it's so much information processing so fast, you can't really react. And it's like, there's no time for fear because it's all happening within a minute. And it's like, that's the, it's a mile of ice covered in one minute. And it's just pure, like just info overload. So you just have to kind of just go with it. But as you progress, it's weird to say, but things start to slow down. Your reaction time and your, your moment, your um, movement patterns start to mimic or at least anticipate everything that's happening, and then the variables change, you adjust with it. So the initial going down from a walk, like a, someone pushed me down, I was like, woo, that's a lot. But then the first time I actually got to sprint off the top, which during a race, which is what you never want to do ever, but they told me, sure, let's, let's see what happens. And I had a really good push. It was during a pretty big race. It was a national champs, which is not, not, a, not an ideal situation. And I... Everything was going so, so much faster because I came in with more speed. My reaction time was way delayed. I was just missing my entrances, missing my exits. So you're ping-ponging the whole way down the track, which is not pleasant because it's very painful. You get lots of bumps and bruises, but it didn't like deter me from it. I still was like, oh, I, you know, I, I know what changed. I know I can fix it. So then it becomes more of a challenge of fixing one corner, which would then fix another corner. So it's like this continual. So the only initial fear I had was that first time at start four. And over time, like it kind of was just like, it's just, this is a sport. Now, when you go to a new track, the fear comes back. You have the butterflies. You're like, okay, if I don't know what I'm doing. This can really go bad really quick, but it can also be really fun. So I think for me, it was just that one pivotal moment where I was like, I might not do this again was start four, which is funny because that's the slowest I ever went down the track ever. But um it's it's pretty exciting and it's it's one of those things where like when we have passenger rides come down that's where people go from and it's just it's so much information so quick it just there's nothing to compare it to but it's it's pretty fun though i do enjoy it <laughs> i'm glad yeah that it sounds like fun but i can imagine it being scary the first time but then after that you kind of build up a tolerance to it i would think but i was gonna ask you i was curious if the tracks are always the same or if they're different depending on the competition so it's like you know, there's a certain number of turns or how do you prepare for that? Like in your training, do you know the track ahead of time? And then how do you, like you said, mentally prepare to go down an unfamiliar path and have to adjust like in the middle of the race? So um, 
swimming and track are similar. Like the, uh, the, the track will always be the same for the most part. Same mm -hmm. distance, same turn, same everything for the most part, the layout. Um, I believe they're, they make a new track almost every Olympic. So it's maybe like 14, 16 tracks that exist. The ones that are actually functional, you know, depends if someone's closed or if it shuts down permanently. But every track is different. Each track has um, certain every track has a certain components to it like a labyrinth or um a high not a highway but there's certain things that are required but the tracks are all different the ramps are different the um the slope with the grade is different um i believe like park city is like the highest altitude um i don't know the word altitude i think for um any track in the world and i think saint moritz saint moritz is in uh switzerland and that's the only handmade track so they remake it every year they rebuild it but it's one of the longest tracks in the world and then you have one in whistler vancouver which is the fastest track in the world so every track has different components to it and depending on the type of slider certain components might speak to your abilities more so if you're more experienced you're a good driver sometimes the longer tracks will be in your favor especially if it's very technical versus someone who's relatively new in the sport, but you have a fast push or you have, you know, your ability to kind of relax and glide. Certain tracks like Park City, Eagles or Winterberg might speak to you more because they're shorter and they're more flowy. So the problem is, or not really the problem, the challenge is on a circuit, we have all these different tracks. So you have to figure out how to get down as fast as possible. So we don't get access to track time early. It's not just any tracks open at any time. So, as simple as it sounds, we watch a lot of POVs and we lay on our sleds. Um, so pretty much all the preparatory work we can do like in the summertime, outside of like just push training, if we're trying to work on driving, is laying on our sleds and going through mine runs and watching POVs. So we have our notes from training, from races we've been in past or places you've never been, you get notes from someone else and you kind of use it as a guide and you just lay on your sled and kind of just go through your turns and you work, work your shoulders through it and how your body will respond. But then when you actually get there, you have to match that with the real time. So the reaction time, like, oh, I didn't expect that. Or you know, there was a bump in this part. There's more buildup, which is the other, th the other thing, too. Like Lake Placid, which is where I'm at right now, the ice doesn't cut the same every year. It's the general layout because that's just the track. But how the ice is shaped changes because everyone cuts differently every year. So every year, every track, every time we come back somewhere, it's always relatively new. There's certain components that are very, you know, specific to it, like that's what you expect, but you have to be able to respond to it each time. And what makes it more interesting is most times during an actual circuit, we have eight races, you have three training days and two training runs per day to prepare for the race for points. So a lot of it is just, you have to be really adaptable. You have to be really just kind of just just do it. You can't think about it. You can't overanalyze. You just got to do it no matter what, which I think speaks to my ability from, from coming from a, a multi in the heptathlon. Once you do an event, you got to shut it off, go on to the next one. So anyone that's doing multiple events in any of like relays and swimming or just doing different things, you have to do that event, focus on that one thing. And then when it's done, it's done, move on to the next one. And which is something I learned later, which I wish I learned sooner because it would help a lot. But the track usually is about a mile long. It might be 14 to 16 curves, depending. If you make a mistake in one curve, you have to, okay, made a mistake, fix it, move on. If you don't catch it, then it kind of compounds the rest of the track and you kind of slow down the rest of the way. So it's a constant, like, you're straining your nervous system trying to stay on it the whole time. And then when you finally finish, everyone's like out of breath because it's like you just fried yourself for a whole minute. And virtually what it comes down to is the best people in the world um make it look very easy and then you have the newer people who just it looks like you're fighting this the whole way down so over time you start to build this ability to like okay like you have the experience of the knowledge of what to expect and you have virtually every scenario possible and then you just relax in the sled and it's this balance between like i'm driving but i'm also letting it do what it needs to do so it's a balance between control and chaos the whole way down I like that. I like that description. That's good. <laughs> Balance between control and chaos. Nice. So you said that your transition from track and field to skeleton was pretty smooth coming out of college, right? What was, was that transition like and what made you decide that you wanted to continue sports professionally beyond college? And then did any of your Queens teammates do the same? Did you have anyone that, you know, followed that same path as you? So I came in, uh, 
to college like a semester late, I guess. I missed the fall semester previous, so I graduated behind my class. So when I burned through my eligibility, which was the spring of 2016, I believe, I had this like, what do I do now? Like, how do I pay for the rest of my college? How do I, or like, how do I maintain my sanity with one more semester? And so I was like, well, I can run an attach. That's what most people did anyway. And then once we got the email from our coach saying, hey, there's this combine, um, you know, we should do it. I didn't really slide that much that first semester, uh, well, that first semester back into school, which was the fall of 2016, uh, simply because I was just committed to working with, I was an assistant um, coach with the track and field team. So I was kind of just doing that, doing my thing. And then as the spring came around, I was like, I got to, you know, figure out what I want to do because I graduated, I'm done. And so the the easiest way to put it was I lived as a college student for like four years. So I had like my on season, my off season of where I trained and I went to school and then I took off, worked and just did whatever. So it kind of mimicked what already my lifestyle was. So it made it an easy transition in that perspective. And just moving around as much as we do is travel like a kind of like, I guess it's like going to a track meet or going somewhere for a competition. It's no big deal. So it was very easy for me to make that transition. The biggest difference was like just paying, obviously. But I think in that perspective, that made it a lot easier. And then for my track and field background, my specialties and how I trained was something that was very much lacking on the scene in the sport, as far, especially from our program the different things that I was able to do that some of the athletes couldn't do because I was a hurdler, which was unique to the push, helped me actually kind of stand out a little more. And it's one of those things where it's like, if I'm not good at it, you can just tell me and I'll leave, you know, no big deal. No feelings hurt. But they're like, oh, you actually have a good start. You have a good push. This could really help you down your career. So it's like, okay, well, if I have something to build off of, then I can just work on the pushing or the the driving. And so over time, that would kind of be my focus. Like I knew I had the push, so I can kind of back off of that and focus on driving, which is more important. And so for me, I was pretty comfortable with the lifestyle adju- like adjustment because I was already doing that. And my physicality was able to kind of maintain itself because I came from college like fresh out. So from that standpoint, all I had to work on was the very technical aspect of driving, which is something that I had to learn because I kind of like to relax in that scenario. And some tracks you cannot relax and kind of just let it go because, you know, things happen. So I think it was just, it was an easy transition in the sense that I'd have to make too many adjustments to my life versus some teammates I have that have actual careers, they're nine to five, they have a family or they're trying to start a family or whatever it is. And then they come out to recruiting camps and it's just like, you have to either give it all up, you have to make this huge change or jump in your career or something drastic and you have to make a decision. Like, do I want to stay or do I want to try to make this work? And, you know, so for me, I didn't have that big weight to make the decision. So I was kind of just making a lateral move, just going into professional sport. Yeah, that was one of the things that I was curious about was, you know, when you pursue a sport professionally and you're out of college and, you know, four years, the quad cycle, it's a long time. So I was wondering what it was like for skeleton as far as like what competitions you had, what milestones. And then, like you said, you had friends who had careers and families and all of these things outside of that, because sports are such a huge commitment with your, your time, your money, your resources, your energy. And so how do you make that decision to like, to, to sacrifice certain parts of your life to chase this dream? And did you have to sacrifice any pieces of your life to go after this? I wouldn't necessarily, call, for me personally, I don't call it much of a sacrifice because I maintain my lifestyle. Um, I wasn't really a social person. Like I would go out, you know, sometimes Thursday nights, but like, you know, you have your moments where you go out with your friends, but I wasn't really going out all the time during college anyway. So I wasn't really a partier like that. I wasn't really going out to these extravagant, like out with the girls kind of thing. I was very much just a bookworm, you know, I I'd watch my Netflix and kind of relax and work out and just be the student athlete that, you know, Queens. So for me, that proponent was very imperative in my transition because I didn't really have to make any of those kind of sacrifices. Um, and I, my work schedule was pretty much similar anyway. Like I have my summer job and then I work when I can, when I'm in season, the difference came in when it was just like, it's the auto up- upfront costs. So you have to fly somewhere and go somewhere to train and compete and ours base camp is pretty much like Boston, new york 
So for the first few years, I was North America Cup. So I stayed in the U.S. I went to Lake Placid. I would go to Park City, Utah. And then I went to Calgary, um, Canada a couple of times. So my travel was pretty, you know, set forth. So I knew what to expect. I knew it was expense wise how, you know, this was going to map out in a season. Once you start going across the pond and you go to Europe, that's when it gets really, really expensive because you got to pay for your equipment to get over there. You got to pay for um, your lodging yourself, which is the other thing that was a little deceptive is they tell you you're self-funded. You don't know how self-funded you are until you are actually in the heat of it. And it's like, oof, you know, and it's it's just one of those things where you have to really be creative and how to like, how am I going to make this work? You know, so sometimes you got to like find other athletes like, hey, let's put all our equipment in one bag and like, we'll split the cost or let's stay together at this location. Let's, you know, do something like like they just a lot of it's um, collaboration work. Um, but this past season, for instance, I went to a location by myself. I went to Norway, which is just not cheap. But I got a lot of out, I got out of it. So I, you have to prioritize like, hey, is it more important for me to get this experience here or to go on vacation in the summer with, you know, for whatever? You know, I, I always want to get Disney World, but, you know, Disney World will always be there. I need to go to Norway right now. And so what it comes down to is just there's certain things that you just understand, like it's necessary, especially if you're trying to work towards something that's it's a long time to get to four years. But at the same time. You have to be on it right when it's like it's time to perform. So like it's this is Olympic season right now, and if you don't peak at the right time, it could cost you qualification. So it's understanding that it's a necessary, you know, pay your dues in the sport to make sure you have the necessary skills and experience, so that when you do make it on the circuit, that's you know top tier to actually get to the Olympics, you're ready to compete. So I would say probably the only thing that I was a little bit um, hesitant on as I got older um, was just you're not around your family as much. So I'm one of 11. So that's, you know, you grow up like that. And I went to college, a state away. They're in Virginia. I was in North Carolina. So I was already like you know, away from them a lot. But then as you get older and like family starts to become more important and it's like, oh, well, I like to see them more often. So not as much when you're literally in another country, it kind of makes it more difficult, more apparent. So that's when you start missing birthdays, you start missing the holidays and those things, those like monumental moments. And so that's when it makes it more real. So like, if I'm already going to miss it, let me make it worth the while of missing it. Let me actually try to actually get the experience and stuff that I need to actually progress and actually get towards the dream. Yeah, no, you're, you're so right. Absolutely. And I, I would imagine that the training facilities and the tracks that you guys need are not, um, as common, you yeah, know, right. as like a pool yeah. might be or a track might be. Um, you said you a lot of, you know, in Utah and New York. And um, so you had to like pick up and move to wherever the track was or wherever your team was, right? Um, yeah, so I'm still, I still try to base out of Charlotte. Um, I was able to use the facilities, the Levine Center, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's been a minute. Uh, but then COVID came. So then like obviously things got shut down. So you got to get a little creative. But six months like the summer so from april to september range like i'll be in charlotte and then from september to march ish like i'll be based out of like lake placid but my entire life is in a storage unit in charlotte so i kind of it's like this on and off thing so it's kind of like moving back on campus sort of but um just everything just put into a box for the like, a 10 by 10 for the whole six months <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, that's good that you still get to come back here. And is that considered like your off season that you're here in Charlotte or? For the most part. Um, and like you said, like it's very scarce to get on ice or any type. So we just got a, a brand new ice house, which is where we work on like our push um, for the first 50 meters for the race. And it was very eye opening. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, but it gives us something to work with. So that's which is good which makes another selling point of why to move up to Lake Placid. But then it's the Kokum Lake. Lake Placid is a touristy town. So cost of living is not cheap. And it's just like, is it worth it moving up here or staying in Charlotte? So then you got to weigh these things because like the job scarcity and then everyone's going remote. So every year it's a new like reset. Like, hey, like what, what do we need to happen this summer? What do we need to have? Like what kind of gains do we need to make? And so personally, um, I think it's been – it's been good to have a separation. So I'm, I dedicate six months and I'm up here and I get to leave, I get to go away to be at least in the sun. That's something I really do miss. Um, and it's it's helpful because I fall back on my track and field training, which is what got me in the position to be able to come up here in the first place. So 
what better way than to go back and actually train like the athlete I once was in college and kind of get back, kind of get back in shape and kind of a good starting base. So for the most part, it's, it's a gamble of trying to figure out what do I need to do mentally to be able to come back and be strong? And what do I need to do physically? And how do you make that, you know, close the gap and make it work together in unison? Yeah, I, I was wondering how like COVID impacted your training and competition schedule. I mean, were you able to continue training at home at all? Or did you rely, you mentioned a lot of like visualization, you know, laying on your sled, watching POVs. How important was that or has that been over the past, you know, year or two um, preparing for competitions this year and things like that? So I believe 2019, gosh, it's been a minute, 2020, 2021 season maybe, um, where COVID really shut everything down. Uh, U.S. couldn't travel for the first few months of the season. And so uh, we couldn't travel abroad to Europe. Um, so And no one was racing here. So I and a couple of teammates stayed in uh, the States and I kind of just based in Park City for that, sum that season. So in that respect, Granted, Utah's a little more relaxed in their protocols and stuff. So um, while following the protocols that I have to follow for myself, um, I was able to get some ice time in over there, which is good because that's one, it's a track that I should be pretty good at competitively. And the other, it's just it's a home track that I need to be good at once like we actually start opening up again, actually have international races here. So for me, it was good because it's a different style of track than Lake Placid. Um, like Platts is a little bit longer. It's a little, people would describe it as being thrown into a, like a washing machine, which is not very pleasant. Um, Park City is a lot more open, a lot more build up for swooping and kind of just double pressures and it flows really good. But once you lose, once you make a mistake and you lose your momentum, you kind of decelerate the rest of the track. So it's get your top speed and then maintain it as long as possible. Versus like Placid, if you kind of get off, you have a little more room, wiggle room to kind of get it back. So it's a different style, which is good to work on and then come back to Lake Placid. So I was able to kind of bounce between those two tracks. Um, but I didn't really have to go international until this past season when I went to Norway in no early November. And then we kind of based in Germany, slid around and got some more ice experience over there. And actually getting on new tracks is really imperative, um, especially moving to the next quad after this one. Um, but it's been, a, it's been uh, pretty hard just getting the ice time uh, obviously all the gyms have been shut down. So you have to get really creative with your home workouts and understand that there's certain things that you're not going to be able to quite match without a weight room. But I think what showed up the most was people who actually were dedicated enough to actually still maintain the momentum and keep it going. Like I don't have the resources, but I can still do it. That was what really separated people and made them really successful during that time period. And then coming into the Olympic season. Yeah, definitely staying, <clears throat> staying dedicated and just being creative, like you said, and, you know, finding where there's a will, there's a way, I guess. But yeah, there are things that you just have to accept that you won't necessarily be able to do. But finding, you know, working on what you can work on is super important. Mm -hmm. um, so the team was just announced recently, mm -hmm. right? So as someone who's been through that whole process uh, for a completely different sport. I would love to hear what your experiences are like and what the process is like with Skeleton with, do you guys have a trials competition? How is the team selected? And then along with that, you know, do you have, is there a waiting period between your competition and when you find out and, and what's that feel like? Are you able to be, you know, with your friends and your teammates and your family or just what it, walk me through that whole process and kind of what's going on in your head throughout that whole thing? So this would be my second Olympic team naming, I guess, experience. I was around like when they were naming the uh, 2018 team. Nowhere in contention. So I just watched and it was it was a lot. Um, there's a lot of emotions, there's a lot of um, just raw emotion, which is something I think that's unison for any sport. Um, it's I think it's unique because um, my only two experiences with these type of um, trials i guess is relatively extreme so we had this was pretty much covid lockdown and then the, the 2018 was i think it was different than it had been historically and um, they took us to calgary which is a track i think a lot of athletes hadn't been to so that was pretty disruptive for people's expectations and um like i said very emotional i'm glad i wasn't in it but it was just like whew. um this past season um, the schedule was completely off because of COVID. Um, we had a, the test event for the Olympic site is usually the season prior 
to the games. Um, but because of COVID, it pushed down, um, pushed back people to get to travel and the expectation of when they want to do it. So they actually end up doing it at the beginning of the season, which is unheard of because that disrupts travel plans and everything. So for us, uh, the U.S. program specifically, we had our team trials last March. So March of 2021. Normally ours is in like October of the season. So we have, you know, the freshest people coming in. They kind of make your tour. So theoretically, you're coming off of like a peak of sliding. So you're pretty good headspace. You're carrying a lot of momentum. And um, surprisingly, actually, with how the conditions were, apart because we... I think this uh, past season we we did two races in Park City and then two races in Lake Placid, so it get, it caters to both a style of athletes and athletes who started in Park City and those who started in Lake Placid. It's not just like a sweep, but um, progressively everyone did really well. Like everyone was on it. Everyone's like Park City. We had track records broken. We had you know people challenging the starts. We had a lot more consistency and a lot of people hitting markers that they never hit before. Um, I think previously, um, prior to that race. Um, in an actual clocked race, I think we only had maybe two or three women sub 50 seconds at Park City, which is really fast. Um, and it was, it was a, it was a long time since. And then on training, I think someone hit it, but then during that race itself, our team trials, I think we had all top seven girls sub 50. So ice was, it was a great recipe as ice was good. Um, it was the right amount of adrenaline for everybody. Everyone had like, just everything was set up perfect. When we got to Lake Placid, I was in a good spot and I felt, I just, the conditions were not anything I was used to. And I, that's just consistent experience. So I just didn't know how to set up myself to be able to do anything. So I kind of felt, so I was like, all right, fine. That's my, that's, it wasn't ex necessarily expected, but it was within like reason of it being possible. So the other athletes, we have one athlete who has been sliding for, I believe, for almost 20 years. So she was in contention to try to fight for her fifth Olympics. Then we have another athlete who went to the 2018 games. So this would be her second Olympics if she qualified. Then we have a couple of athletes who once lived for, I think, 10 years, another one maybe nine years, and then another one eight to nine years as well. So these are pretty seasoned veterans. And then we have me and this other teammate, four or five years. So it was a big disparity in experience. And so the expectation is obviously you won't, but there's always a possibility that you can, um, especially with um, certain things that, like, both of us had really fast pushes, but it's just a matter of on the day, what can you produce? And what it came down to is consistency and just the right setup for those conditions. I didn't have it. And it was just like a recipe for everything. So that was in March. So then we come over to um, September, October. Normally they name the team after those races, but because there's like discretion and different things, they didn't say anything all summer. So we're just sitting here waiting. Who's, who's woke up, you know? And so we know one person secured for like the women and the men, and there's like that other spot because it's you know whoever they decide. And then finally they finished like they announced it. Like, hey, these are the this is the team. So from that standpoint, it's pretty much locked in where you're going to be. And for my for my position, I didn't make national team. National team is top six, so that's a huge mountain to climb um, because the circuit that I'm on is a development circuit. So there's only so many points. So even if I won the entire circuit, seven hundred points, you know that still would leave a huge gap between me to get to the next circuit. So at that point, I understand that this is just me developing. So there's no, there's no pressure on me. So I can just experience sliding new tracks and this, no stress on me. So I was fine. So I'm just watching again. But the other athletes who are really fighting, which is the top six girls, it's every race matters, every condition matters, every, every rep, everything, you know, how you're setting up. And it's, it was hard because normally during like a season, you don't really repeat tracks on the World Cup level, but we lost a track because it was like uh, Germany had flooding. So one of the tracks got destroyed. Um, some of the tracks just never uh, got up and running in time. And then there was like the whole North American continent was just off the map for World Cup because they didn't want to risk, you know, COVID with our protocols. So a lot of it was just, we repeated in a couple of spots that were, you know, unique and it was just some people were going there for the first time. So for World Cup, it was kind of a strain for certain athletes because you don't want to learn a brand new track at the highest level competition in front of a camera. That's not great. That's not a good setup. And then we have other athletes who have been sliding for 10, nine years on the step down circuit. And the points aren't quite as much, but the competition is almost relatively the same because a lot of athletes who just in other nations where the sport is really big, 
these are just athletes who didn't make World Cup. They're still World Cup caliber, but they're just a circuit lower. So you're fighting a really good fight, and it's just you're trying to get these points. And just, at the end of the day, the points are what they are when they finish. So then you get to, like, okay, we're going to name the team. Like, they finished the last race for World Cup in St. Moritz, and I think there was – normally there's, like, a couple of days, but, they like, literally the day after, they just named it. And it was – because there was a lot of speculation because they're, like, um, I think – they were only going to count seven races and so on, so they might count six races. So if they if they went one way or the other, they would change who was their second sled. So there's this nail biting. I'm just like stressed. So like we just I crunched the points. I was watching the race, and I'm just like you're holding your breath, you're holding, you're crossing your fingers. So the how it went is how it went. But then there's also the contingency plan where it's like, okay, hey, well if someone tests positive, the next person's got to move up if it's within this timeline. But then we had like multiple cases of people testing positive throughout the season. So then it's like well, how soon to this deadline window did you test positive? Because if you still have something in your system, then they'll flag you for it. And, you, you know, there's this whole protocol. So this has probably been the most stressful. And once again, I'm glad I wasn't a part of it because it was just it was so much. But it was a lot of learning for me, just seeing how it works and seeing how people operate under this kind of stress. Obviously, hopefully in 2026, it won't be this bad. But like, it's just it makes you really realize like people have dedicated half their lifetimes to do this. So naturally, they're going to be very emotional about it, but it's just like the moment one thing's and it just it doesn't matter. Like you train four years of your life for that one moment. If you don't show up that one moment, it's done, and you have to wait another four years, or you have to wait. And you know, not that you wish it's someone, but someone has to test positive for you to get that chance. And so it's just it's been very eye opening, I think, and it's been very um, just very telling as far as like what are people willing to do to make sure that they get to, you know, whatever the destination they want to be. And for me, it's just been, it's been an experience of just understanding how certain things contribute to pressure and stress. And if you don't have a base plan of how to handle the mental component of just sliding in general, you're not going to be able to handle it when it's under this kind of stress. When you have something like a pandemic, making a break in your career, or if you have something just out of your control, which a lot of it is out of your control. So I've been privileged to be able to witness and be a part of these trials. Um, normally they do happen in a less stressful environment and um, within a lot more like controlled settings and a lot more things that you can actually think about. So I think it's just I can't imagine what it is in other sports like swimming or anything, but like for skeleton, because it's such a smaller group and you see everybody and you actually know them, you spend a lot more time with them. It's just like, it's really in the moment all the time. And then you, you feel for everybody, but at the same time, it's like, it's, it's everyone had the same scenario. You know, we we're all fighting for this, these two spots or three spots. Yeah. That's such a small team. How many people, I guess this time around were fighting for those, you know, two or three spots. Uh, during the 2018, trials i think there were my, maybe 15 girls um uh, this time around we had maybe eight mm -hmm. so the team has been dropping and then after this we might be less than that going to the next squad it's just um it's part of recruiting mm -hmm. and just retainment of athletes at that point yeah yeah so so your current goal is to continue training for the 2026 games right yeah if i can like maintain health and you know Get, a, get some sponsorships that would be very helpful but yeah the goal is to i mean as, as long as i got it in my legs as long as i got it in my mind that i actually enjoy it and actually having fun then i don't see why not there's plenty of room to grow as an athlete and just get better and kind of just push the barrier see how fast i can go it's always the addicting component to it absolutely absolutely well, yeah you put so much time and energy and everything into this i mean you you have to love it at the end of the day right otherwise that's it's a lot to put yourself through if you don't love what yeah. you do so what's your favorite thing about skeleton like what's what drew you to it what keeps you going um i'll tell you a little story i was working at a, a chinese restaurant and I happened upon this guy came in. It turned out he was a, he was a Tai Chi instructor. And um, long story short, I like, got his connection. I got his information. And we started talking about Tai Chi and like training. And then he asked me, like, what is my experience with, you know, martial arts and different things I've done in the past? And I was like, oh, well, you know, I've, you know, I've watched plenty of movies and I've, I try to do it through YouTube, but I would like to do it in a controlled setting. And then he got to the subject of flow, the flow state. 
He's like, do you know what flow is? I was like, I'm familiar with it. He's like, have you ever experienced it? And I was like, yes. And there's, it's that thing where it's when everything just lines up perfectly in that moment. And I'm sure you know what that feels like. And it's, it just, everything feels good. And it's, it's, it's weird. It's hard to describe to people who don't understand or never felt it. But there was one recently placid where I just, my legs felt good. I had a good mind. I wasn't stressed. I wasn't panicking. I got to the line. I got my rhythm. It was, everything was good. And then I, I pushed, it was a good push. And I got on the sled and everything was just butter. It was just smooth and it was just fast. And I ended up winning the race, which was good. Um, but it's this constant addiction to try to get that feeling back. You want to feel the flow state again. You want to feel the natural flow of how sliding should be. And you want to feel the speed. And so when everything lines up just perfect like that, it's, it's a very addicting feeling to try to get back at. And I think in total of the five years I've slid, I might have experienced it two, maybe three times. And it's just like you have to really work on like every component of everything, but at the same time you can't expect it to all happen at once. Just it will happen, and it's I guess a lot of it's preparatory work to, to get to that point. And obviously the pandemic does not help. It makes you very stressed out. But um, so this is all pre-pandemic. But it just it's that weird it's that feeling where it's just like I I can do it. I can push this barrier. I can go for this record. I can I can hit that mark. And I think it's. It's just something that once you get a taste of it, it's it's not you always want it again. You're gonna always want it, and, and then it's something you keep chasing, which I think is why we have people that slide for twenty years. Um, you've maxed, you've you've been the best, you are the best, and like how can I, you know, push the barrier further? So then it's like testing new equipment, testing new things, and how do I get faster off the start? And so these different components to put together constant, constant, constant to be the better competitor, the better athlete, and then just you know, be the, the top athlete in the world. So. I'm not the top athlete, so there's obviously a huge ceiling to try to hit. But one thing I am really focused on, and this was getting towards that, is my push. And I think that's – I enjoy that specifically because it's something that I'm really strong at. And I know there's a lot of people that look at me and like, wow, your push is really good. Can you – you know, like, what is, what is your secret? And it just – the secret is for mobility, honestly, and just mobility in your hips. But it's – I think it's – over time as an athlete, we overcomplicate things and make it so hard to be able to understand how to grasp something. But then it's just how do you how do you how integrate you with your body, and that's what it comes down to. And so I think there was a time I kind of got away from that, and so my my performance started to get a little choppy. But coming back to realization, like you gotta really be in tune with your body to, be able to perform at that level. Yeah, and I, I love how you talk about flow and describe flow. You know, as athletes, we talk about that all the time. And like you said, you've maybe experienced it twice. You know, in all of these years of doing this, it is it's so rare. And like you said, everything just has to fall perfectly into line but then once it does though it's easy if once you're in flow like it's it's easy and everything just feels right it's not you're not overthinking it so i mean for swimmers at least i don't know about other sports everyone has a very very different like pre-race routine and mindset that they have to be in do you think for people who do skeleton do they all you know have a very similar mindset do you have to be very relaxed do you have to like have your heart rate up what what do you do right before you go down a race what is your routine and what kind of mindset do you have to be in um so for me like i if i wake up in the morning well first like i always like shower to kind of make sure i like, hot shower and make you just kind of really warm up because we're going outside and most of the time you're lucky if it's 20 degrees so you got to start off warm to kind of maintain what you got um I do my normal warm up routine, like drills and stuff like that. But once it gets to like race component, like I have it down to like time. Like I know 15 minutes before, like I'm on the block. I, you know, that's when I put my speed suit on and I don't tie my shoelaces and tight until I'm seven people out. And then once I actually get going, like I have, like I keep on my coat and gear on just maintain the, the heat I have. But then once you go outside, everything off. Don't look at anybody. Don't talk to me. Don't don't fist pump me. Don't do nothing. Leave me alone. And it's mainly just because, for the most part, especially this past season, we're going to new tracks, so I gotta really like relax. And from that point, it's just I only dedicate five seconds to the push, my brain capacity. So I have like my routine once I get into my block position. I like, hit my toes on the block. I I have my three breaths. And when I'm ready to go, I just go. There's no reservation. There's no, there's no weight. There's no nothing. It's just go. The moment my chest hits the sled and I tuck in, 
now we're on curve one. How do I get into curve one? So everything has its like segmented time to get into it. And that's how I operate. I have teammates or I've seen people, they have the loudest rock, metal, anything you can think of. And it's, that stresses me out because it's like your, your heart rate's getting up. And like, you have to relax. Like you have to like, you can't fight the track. And so, but some people like they get really amped up and they're pacing. And like one metaphor got uh, announced to use is one of the German athletes, like he's like a caged tiger. I'm like that doesn't feel good to me at all. Like that sounds terrible. And so he's just really anxious. And then like he gets his first run. He, he's really fast off the block. And then like, you know, he's a good run, but to him, it's not good. And so he's like, okay, I got, the, I got the bad one out the way. His second run's usually always better, but there, it's such an array of athletes that some of them get really amped up and then they just take the, amp, the amped up and just go on the ramp. And some of them like get amped up and then they quiet down and then they get on the ramp. I have to be like, I'll amp up when I wake up and then it's just chill. I might listen to a Disney soundtrack, like, you know, to get amped. That's just me. And then once I get to the track, like I'll maybe 30 minutes out, I'll be doing my finishing my drills and then I'll kind of do some like minimal like Tai Chi stuff to kind of really feel flow in the body in the movement and then kind of shut it down to kind of, cause you're kind of trying to reserve your heat and energy expense. Cause in track, you're always like, we want to your sweat. You can't do that here because you'll have hypothermia. And so you got to really pace it out. And so that's something I learned over time, but it's just like, it's interesting to see how people prepare for sliding and it could be, and it'll be the same routine for if we go to somewhere like Ultimate, which is a very, very technical track or somewhere like Eagles where it's a lot more relaxed setting. And usually the more technical tracks, people get like the new people, especially are really stressed out. It's like, oh my God, like, okay, I got, I got to really got to nail it. And so they really hone in on like, I have to, I have to, I have to. And then the more experienced athletes are kind of just, they're pretty chill. Like, you know, they, they've been here before they've done it and they just, they kind of know what to do. And then the middle group is kind of just like, this could go either way, you know, like who knows what's going to happen. So I think it's just like when people, when you have your routine, what works for you, you have to maintain that no matter what. It doesn't matter if the, tr the track changes, if it's snowing, it doesn't matter if it's sleeting. It could be 40 degrees outside with the sun out, you know, and the ice is melting. Like you have to maintain it because that's the only consistency you're going to have going to something where you have no control of the environment like that. So I have my routine. I, I, I've brought it from track and field. So that's why I kept doing it because it helps me reset before I get off the block. But um, yeah, I think that's that's been probably the funniest thing I've seen. Um, just some people just get really amped up, and I have to like walk away because it stresses me out. And my heart rate picks up. I'm like, okay, I gotta do a decompress now for another five minutes. So I try to really self isolate when I'm getting into restay. Gotcha. Yeah, no, everyone's got a different routine. It's it's the same in swimming too. I love seeing what people do in like the call rooms before the race or right behind the blocks, you know, some people are smacking themselves and like heavy metal, like you said, and other people are over there, you know, listening to Disney and doing their thing and, you know, calming down and you just have to find what works for you. And I'm, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm really glad that you talked about how you, you took that from track and field, like what worked for you there works for you here. That's really interesting, but I'm glad that you, you figured out your routine and nailed that down so early so that now that you're going into a different sport, you have that consistency, even when other things are out of your control. That's very cool. It's very interesting. Um, that, that was the last question that I had for you. Um, but you are very nice and very articulate and I love all the stories that you had. It was really fun hearing about all of this. I, didn't know anything about skeleton going into this. So I learned a lot today. So thank you for that. That was really cool. Yeah, of course. Uh, um, I know I get a little cut off and go on tangents. So I, I hope I answered questions and gave you some clarity on some things. No, you absolutely did. I, I loved it. I, I love just hearing you talk about how, you know, how passionate you are about all of this and how much you love it and how chill you are with everything too. I, I love that so much. That's a really good energy. Um, I, Thank you so much for your time today. I'm sorry for taking up so much of it, no, no, um, no. but I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today um, and answering all of my questions so wonderfully and beautifully. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording now, yep. um, if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs>